It's Ron Part 21 of Understanding the Kingdom. In fact, if I do three more lessons, this will become the longest series that I've ever taught. We had someone comment on Facebook this week. I guess he didn't look at the date of the last time we had when we had posted number 19. And he was asking if our YouTube channel was, uh, was dormant because he hadn't seen anything posted, a new series since Understanding the Kingdom. <laughs> well, you may have to wait until 2017 for us to get off of this because there's so much in the Word of God about the kingdom. And this is kind of a survey. Now, we're, 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 kind of, we're moving into understanding David. And to be truthful, if I actually took part David's life, and really taught in detail on it, this could be part 21 of the life of King David. But we're not doing that. We're looking at kingdom principles, things that we can, uh, we can learn, extrapolate from the Word of God, and learn how to appropriate and move in the kingdom uh, in these last days. Now, here a couple of years ago, God had me literally transition all the ministry when I began writing the Shinar Directive. We changed a lot of things here. Uh, we moved to a closed television studio for Biblical Life TV. Uh, some of you that were here probably remember this. I'm, I'm done with dealing with anybody but the remnant. And God had me specifically begin to, to hone in on the remnant. And we're finding out that there's more remnant outside the church than there is inside the church. And we're, we're hearing from them all over the world. And one of the things, those that are, are true remnant... You don't play religious games. You don't play political games. You don't learn the carnival that we call modern Christianity in, in, in church. You don't learn to do that. And a lot of times you find yourselves on the backside of the desert, kind of out by yourself. And I, I want to deal with that this morning and take a real look at David and some of the things that happened with David because there is a time that all of us that have a true anointing that have, have a true calling in our life to be a part of the remnant, there will be a time in our life that we find ourselves in the wilderness, set apart from all the religiosity that's going on in the earth so that God can do some things in our lives. Every remnant member will find this. Now I want to start this morning in 1 Samuel 16, verses 12 through 15. This is the anointing of King David. And so we pick up here in verse 12, and this is Sam. He says, And he sent and brought him in now. Now he was ruddy and with all of uh, beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel stood up, arose up, and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from, the, from God troubleth thee. Now there, there are several things that we need to look at here. In, in today's economy in the kingdom of God, if you had some national prophet that had a perfect track record, Samuel had a perfect track record. Not one word that he ever said fell to the ground and did not come to pass. If he called you out, brought you up in front, anointed you and said, this is what God has called you to do in the modern church, you would have it made from that day forward. And it kind of seems at first that maybe David did. It was after this time that he's still a kid, still a teenager. He goes up and he kills Goliath. Then this evil spirit that comes on Saul is only abated when David plays his harp for the king. So now he's in the king's court. Everything's like, man, you're up and coming. You're going to be the king. You're doing all this, that, and the other. But we need to understand one of the things that God kept on telling Mary and I back years ago was yield to the time of preparation. Let me tell you something. Sometimes in the kingdom of God, nobody likes the time of preparation. Because the time of preparation is more than Bible college or seminary. 
You can have your head trained up and your heart all wrong. That's why we have so many people today in pulpits that have this long uh, pedigree among academia that has been contaminated by the elite that are saying that there's no such thing as the virgin birth. There was, there was never a creation. There was, there was never Noah's Ark. Uh, I was surprised that there was some expert that came on Oprah right after uh, Easter here a couple weeks ago and said that the crucifixion never happened. Proclaiming themselves to be wise, they become as fools. We have, we have so, we, see what, what God had to do with David. We had Saul, who was small in his own eyes. God anoints him. Everybody pushes him forward. And so he goes from, from serving, kind of a shepherd, helping with his dad's farm and flock and all this stuff. Next thing you know, they're building a palace for him. And he went from being small in his own eyes to being big in his own eyes. And Saul got so big that he believed that he did not have to obey God. He was moved by politics. He was, he was moved by, I, I need to do this because the people are leaving from me because God tarried. And how many ministries have we seen that had done the exact same thing? I have respect for men of God that preach the word and refuse to compromise on the word and have done so and watched over half of their congregation leave. To me, that is not a sign of defeat. That is a sign or a badge of honor. They need to be respected because the Laodicean church would not hear the word of God. And as far as I'm concerned, if the Laodicean church doesn't repent, they can just hit the door. Because they will end up contaminating and taking over everything at believing the Masonic doctrine that money can mimic spirituality. And so they compromise for money and eventually money becomes their God. Well, so God is in the, he sees what happens with Saul and he says, I'm going to find someone who is, who is a man after my own heart. But he also had to purge some things out of David. There was this time of preparation. Now the first stage of preparation was he was faithful as a shepherd over, over his father's flock and he was worshiping God and that enabled him to enter into this covenant and, and God said, okay, I choose him to do some things, but just because you're chosen doesn't mean you're ready. Oh, how I and Mary have learned this. You know, when, when God said yield to the preparation time, I was already a president of a seminary. I already had doctorates hanging on the wall. And it's like what God said is, now you're finally ready for me to take you back to kindergarten and prepare you. <laughs> and I'm glad he did. Because we would not be doing anything that we're doing now had God not done that. And so we pick up here in 1 Samuel 19, verses 8 through 10. Now, everything is looking great for David. He, 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 can, he can be a general over an army. He's playing in the king's court. He is the one who killed Goliath. He is the one that Samuel anointed to be the next king. And it says, and then there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines, and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. Sounds like everything's turning up roses for David, right? And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. And as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, David played with his harp, and Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped by night. So here you are, you're being faithful, you're anointed, you're called, and the old guard is trying to kill you. Now one of the reasons, a lot, one of the, thing, one of the things that I have discovered in the last year and a half, and it's really, it's really when, you're, when you're living in the Laodicean church era, you're going to find that there are more of the remnant outside the church than there are inside the church 
because the old guard has so compromised and, and they have built this kingdom around them that everything they do in ministry is what's good for the budget. What's going to keep the people coming? What's going to keep the people happy? Uh, it's like I'm going to offer this sacrifice because the people are, are being withdrawn away from me and all of a sudden all this compromise goes on. That kind of guard will begin persecuting the new generation that are anointed and have a heart after God. And so they begin to, to, to find themselves driven out. How many people have I heard from that said there was this blatant sin going on in the church and when I brought it up to the leadership, they drove me out of the church rather than deal with the sin. And so a lot of those, a lot of the remnant right now have been driven out. And let me tell you something, God had a purpose for it. Because if you had not been driven out, if you had not been sent into the wilderness, a few years down the road, you would have been in the same place the current leadership is. In the position of compromise. That there's something about the wilderness experience, there's something about when you are put into a secluded place. That God begins to work on you. Now, I did some research and, and uh, some scholars suggest that if you just look at the number of places and how long David spent when you're reading through the narrative in the Bible, they say, you know, he could have been on the run eight years. But other scholars say it could be as many as 15 to 20 years that David was on the run from King Saul. But it was at that time he built up what's called you know, the David's mighty men. He, he found, you see, it, it's, it's not when everything is rosy that you find out who your friends are. It, it's when times are rough. It's when, it's when you're, you're, out of, you're out of popularity. It's when you're out of these things and God throws you into this wilderness experience. It is there in obscurity that you find out those who are really your friends. Those that will stand by you. I remember reading, there was, there's a, a passage, unless you really do the research, David is kind of getting homesick. Now he's kind of far away from home. The army that's hunting him is between him and Bethlehem. And he has these men that are in covenant with him. And he says in passing, he says, oh, he said, if I could just get a drink of water from the well. From back home. Those men understood covenant. One of his men got up that night, ran all the way to the well through enemy lines, if you will, got him water and ran back through it. So when David woke up the next morning, he had a drink of water from his hometown. That's covenant. But see, you only develop those things in the wilderness experience, I see a pattern in the kingdom. Now, we're not talking about churchianity. We're not talking about denominations. We're not, we're not talking about any type of religiosity whatsoever. We're talking about kingdom. And kingdom, in the lives of many within the Word of God, God had to take them through a time of preparation. And Saul did not go through that time of preparation. And we see what happened to Saul? He allowed privilege and wealth to go to his head. And how many times in ministry? You see, the, for, for many of us, it's not the hard places that it's easy to be faithful with God. Now, some may get mad in the hard places and walk away. Well, you weren't remnant to begin with. Remnant always tend in the hard times to press into God. But we need to understand that in those hard places, God, you need to allow God to forge some things into you that when you're brought out of obscurity, you do not let Laodicea and the mystery religions and the world's system of wealth and affluence to begin tainting what God has called you to be. That takes a time of preparation. Moses went from being a prince in Egypt. God took him on the backside of the desert. 
He had to be driven out, cast out of Egypt. He discovered who he was and was going to do in the flesh that which can only be done by God. God sends him around Mount Sinai in the wilderness in the backside of the desert. And for 40 years, God burned Egypt out of Moses. You see, that's one of the things that I... Uh, you know, God has a sense of humor, I've found. And I've asked God, there were times when we were going through this, this process of preparation. I asked God, I said, how come it's taking so long? Anybody ever ask God that? How, how come it's taking so long, God? You know, I, I've, I've, got, I've got the education. I've got this. I've got that. Why is it taking so long? And I remember sitting at my desk asking God that, and I, I swear it was just as clear as anything, and God said, knowing you, it will probably take at least twice as long as anybody else. That's when you bow your head and say, thank you, sir, may I have another? Now, I'm grateful that it wasn't 40 years. I'd hate to try to be doing now what Mary and I are doing in, in, our, in our 50s, late 50s, I, I sure wouldn't want to do it in my 80s. All right, Mary, it's time for us to hit today. I'm, I'm glad at least there's, there's still some resemblance of youth, although I am the reason why there are widescreen TVs, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not the younger, thinner version of myself, but one of the things I have learned in the wilderness is you cannot count on your own abilities, You know, that it, it's, it's not by power, it's not by might, it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. And, if it, and I trust in the anointing of God. I trust in the leading of the Holy Spirit. I trust in this word, and this word reveals reality to me, even though I have been convinced in an unreality, this word always brings me back to reality. That's one of the, when Jesus said, I, I've come to, to give you truth, I'm the way, the truth, and life. One of the, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, truth can mean reality. That when the devil has pulled the wool over my eyes because I'm not trusting in what I see with my eyes or feel with my flesh or confidence in my abilities, then I lean on the Lord and his understanding that always brings me back to kingdom reality. Without that, we are nothing. This morning before we started, I would rather have went home and laid down. And if, if those of you that were here, it's like I started to pray. I got straighter. The anointing came. I know if the anointing is not here. You see, the remnant trust in the anointing, the remnant trust in the Word of God, the remnant trust in the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we will not do anything to grieve the Holy Spirit. What happens in that wilderness experience is we find out what grieves God and we, uh, we, we, we try to push that back because it's like the plague to us. That's part of what Moses was doing in the backside of the wilderness. God had to get the, the concepts of mystery Babylon in which he was raised. Egypt was built on mystery Babylon. That the uncle of Nimrod, Mizraim, founded Egypt. It was this family line from Ham that they, they, were, they were caught up in the knowledge of the watchers, the knowledge of the principalities and powers that fell, and they began developing everything based upon mysticism. And that was what he was raised in. You know, that, that's one of the reasons why Moses, when God says, you know, put your hand in your coat and pull it out, and he pulled it out, and it was leprous, and he put it back, and it, it was back to normal, or throw this, you know, throw this rod down, it turns to a serpent. Moses was not impressed. After seeing all that, he made excuses to God. It's like, I've seen all this in Pharaoh's court. I've seen sorcerers do this. I've seen the occultists, the mystery religions do this. I'm not, in, you know, send somebody else. I'm slow with speech. But what he learned in the backside of the desert was obedience. Something that Saul did not learn because he had not had the preparation time. Saul did not get 
that obedience is better than sacrifice. Whenever I, whenever I am not obedient, I am rebelling against the leadership of God. I am I'm rebelling against the moving of the Holy Spirit. I am rebelling against the Word of God because I would rather align myself with Mystery Babylon for the perks than to be obedient to God. This was burned out of Moses. The God said, Go down. And what's amazing to me, and this shows you the heart of Moses. In fact, for those, you know, I was raised Baptist. And so when you think of apostles, you think of the 12 apostles that Jesus established during his ministry. That all of a sudden, Jesus set up this new, uh, new office of ministry called apostle. But when you study it out, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher were all functional offices in the synagogal system before Jesus. That's one of the reasons why when he says, you're an apostle, they didn't say, cool, what's that? Define what that is. What's my mission statement? What They all knew. When the Sanhedrin sent Rabbi Shaul out to begin capturing Christians, when God nailed them on the road to Damascus, when he left the Sanhedrin, he was an apostle of the Sanhedrin. So who was the first apostle in the Word of God? Moses. Abraham was one of the first prophets. The first apostle was Moses. So when the apostle Paul said, we're established upon the apostles and prophets, in his mind he wasn't thinking about Matthew, John, or any of those. He was thinking about Abraham and Moses. Come on. But look all that to show Moses' heart. Adam and Eve fell because the Nakesh showed up and set the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on fire with his presence. He was a seraphim or a seraph. And so you have this tree that's on fire, and you could probably see it for miles around, and he promises illumination. All it takes to bring down a kingdom built upon the seraph's knowledge of good and evil was a man went and found a little bush that was set on fire from God. God says, I, don't, I got a tree later on planned. It's called the cross. You started this in a tree. I'm going to end it in a tree. But as far as commissioning, all I need is a little bush that I'm going to set on fire with my presence and I'm going to speak to a man named Moses and he's going to go down and he's going to bring your kingdom down. Because everything of Egypt was built upon the knowledge promised by the Nakesh, oh, so much so that Pharaoh believed that he had become a god. He had become Osiris in the flesh after he went through this ritual ceremony based upon esoteric knowledge that at that moment he became Egypt itself. He became a god according to their doctrines. Sounds like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall be as gods. It's the same concept that the Roman emperors said, I've become a god, a Caesar. Worship me. We kind of have that today in some politics, don't we? You can ask me, who running for president right now can we trust? I don't know. I see too much. They're either not trained in the Constitution or they're too deep into the Illuminati pockets. All of them, for me. They don't really give us a choice. I choose Jesus as my king because even though I'm an American citizen, I move in a greater kingdom that usurps or uh, that, that, that is above this kingdom. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and he's also president over presidents. So Moses spent 40 years to purge him from Egypt so that he could be in a position to walk in kingdom power. And let me tell you something, there are a lot of the remnant that God has had to back out of the system so contaminated by mystery Babylon so that God could realign our thinking, realign all these things so that and, and we're entering into a time that just there's going to be the spirit of Elijah released through the remnant 
to call the body of Christ back to the kingdom and back to repentance. As prophecy begins to hit the fan, God's anointed faithful that stepped out of the courts of Egypt. And let me tell you something. If you have a pastor that is a Freemason, he has established a court of Egypt in that pastorate. He bowed before the altar of Nimrod and sought illumination. I bow before the throne of Jesus to receive illumination. The truth of God's Word. And it is the fire of the Holy Spirit that illuminates my path, not the fire of the Nechesh. That's part of what we learn in the wilderness experience. The Apostle Paul, after his road to Damascus experience, and they get them out, he goes on the backside of the desert for three years before he really enters into ministry. Because all my, what's interesting is that, 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 that whenever you get saved, and, you, and God's called you to get into this word, true discipleship, it takes three years to rewire your brain. That is a, both a physiological and psychological fact. And so God says, okay, Messiah's almighty God, this is what he's doing. Are you, know, are you, are you tired of kicking against the goads, Paul? And so Paul goes on the backside of the desert, and he goes back and starts studying Torah and the prophets, and all of a sudden, everywhere he looks, after the scales came off of his eyes, he sees Jesus from Genesis to Malachi. And so at, and I believe it was during that period that he was called up into the third heaven where he had visions to where Jesus taught him. Since he paid no attention to the teachings of Jesus during his three and a half year ministry, he got to be pulled up into the third heaven and Jesus teach him then. That's where we get what we call the Pauline Revelation. But the Apostle Paul had to have this desert experience of being pulled away so that Almighty God could rewire his brain for kingdom rather than religiosity. But we also see that Israel failed the mark. They leave Mount Sinai. They're going through the wilderness. God says, I want you to cross the Jordan. I want you to go ahead and, and take the promised land. Yes, there are, not, there are gibberim in the promised land. But you just saw me bring down the nation that used gibberim doctrine for everything they did. That, that their very ruler claimed to be a gibberim like Nimrod. And I brought them down to nothing. Go get them. And they said, no. You see, they, they failed. There was too short a time in the wilderness or something. They, they had not had Egypt purged out of them. And they accused God. You brought us here so that our kids could get killed while we go to war. And God says, you know what? You're going to die in the wilderness. But that wilderness experience, while you're dying, your kids are growing up, and it's out of that generation that was birthed out of the wilderness that will take the promised land. Oh, now, that's good preaching. I don't know. <laughs> There's a generation coming up out of the wilderness that's getting ready to do some things in the body of Christ. The Hebrew word for wilderness, wilderness is midbar, which can mean wilderness, but it can also mean pasture. It means the area outside of, of cities. But what's interesting, it also means mouth. The organ of speech. Wilderness is a place where Babylon is burned out of you and where you learn to hear the voice of God. It's the place where God's mouth is placed next to your ear. You see, that's what Moses was doing on the backside of the desert. And finally, God says, you know what? Your ear is finally ready to hear. And God set a burning bush up and put it in Moses. I'm going to go see what this thing is. I mean, no, that was a turning point for him. His life was never the same again. I was happy just being a shepherd. 
And I'm sure when those have called to ministry, there's probably times Moses kind of wished he'd have been back before the burning bush a few times with, the, with Israel. But to be able to meet God face to face, to hear God's voice, it's worth it. Even with John the Baptist, now I think John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, the anointing of Elijah. I remember back here years ago, I was at a colloquium, and one of the men that was there specialized in the Essenes. He specialized in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so we were having lunch together, and he says, you want to hear something really cool? And I said, yeah. And he said, the best that we can tell, you know, the Essenes drew away and went into a wilderness place because they saw the corruption that was going on. With the Sadducees, they basically would actually sell the priesthood. And we, they, they were having people that became high priests that were not Cohen. They were wealthy. They were politically in positions that they would basically sell that position. They saw what was going on in the temple. So they pulled back. And that was actually a place where John the Baptist and his mother, when he was a little boy, sought refuge because Jesus actually accused the leaders. He said, you guys killed Zechariah between the porch and the altar. There was a time in the midst of this messianic fervor, there were those that were more concerned with politics and positions of authority. The number one candidate for the Messiah would have been John the Baptist because of, of Zechariah being struck dumb in the temple and could not speak until after his birth. John was the one everybody was looking for to be the Messiah. And so the leadership was looking for John to kill him. And so him and his mother went to the Essenes for safety. And, they, and, and Zechariah was faithful to his family unto death. And they killed him and never found out where John the Baptist was. So he was raised in the wilderness among the Essenes. And come to find out there was something the Essenes had. They literally had the mantle of Elijah. This camel hair mantle that he had, or the camel hair talit that he had, goes all the way back. It was the one owned by Elijah that was given to Elisha. Ended up around the loins, around the waist of John the Baptist. He came in that anointing because before Messiah comes, the spirit of Elijah will be released to call people back to the heart of God. And so John the Baptist had this wilderness experience and he began, he didn't go into the cities, he stood out in the wilderness and began to preach and the people were drawn to him. If it wasn't for that wilderness experience, he could not have been the forerunner of the Lord. And let me tell you something, before the Lord returns, there were going to be many John the Baptists that were in obscurity that in the wilderness place that nobody heard of them, nobody knew what was going on. God in that desert place, he burned the world out of them and burned the kingdom into them so that they would be faithful in their delivery of what God was saying to that generation. We're, we're just about to the place where God is going to release people, the remnant coming out of obscurity that are going to come in a power that the church is not used to seeing. In fact, I, I suspect that they're going to destroy a lot of what the charismatic movement right now is calling church because when they show up, the party stops. Because they will shut down false signs and wonders. I'm getting emails from people all over the country saying, I don't know about this. That I want, when you go to church, everybody just gets drunk in the spirit. There's no word, there's no nothing. And they just get drunk in the spirit. And there's these little signs and wonders and gold dust falling. You know, I said before, I'm not interested in gold dust. When gold bricks start falling, you can go ahead and fund the ministry. But I'm not, all the you know, stuff like that can be fabricated. I mean, we went through the thing where flying feathers. And, the, and, the, and Willie George, when he actually was able to show what was going on and that it was fakery, everybody wanted to destroy him instead of the person doing it, which is kind of crazy. But we, we, we see this because it, it kind of shut down the system. Let me tell you something. The remnant are going to shut down the system when they come. They're going to shut down the false signs and wonders. They're going to shut down this, this because some of these manifestations that we're seeing the same thing is produced by the Dalai Lama. The same thing is produced by 
other occultists in their meetings with their people. God's kingdom is different. When God moves, you sense how holy He is and how unholy you are, and you seek the blood of Jesus to cleanse you and to get right with God, and it produces holiness, and it produces the fire of God on the inside that's supposed to burn off the chaff and supposed to burn in the image of Christ on the inside of us is what we're going to see. Even Jesus had a 40-day wilderness experience where he was tempted by the devil. If Jesus had a wilderness experience, those that are really following him are going to have a wilderness experience. But kingdom power and kingdom purpose has to be prepared in the hearts of people. You see, God, God doesn't really care how eloquently we can speak. Now, I know when the, when, the, when the anointing is on me, I can wax eloquent. I've noticed that in my writings. I, Mary and I have read when I'm writing and the Holy Spirit is empowering me to write. I look back at the times that the Holy Spirit's empowering me to write, and I'm thinking, who wrote that? Because there's an elegance to it that I don't normally possess. But see, it's more than that. For us to move in the level of power that we're going to have to move into in these days ahead, the character of Christ must be burned into our hearts. It must be Jesus and Jesus only. If we have a mixture of Jesus and a mixture of me, that is a, that is a mix for disaster. God is looking for those that are faithful to Him in the hard times, but at the same time will not be lured away with wealth and affluence in the good times. They will not look to mystery Babylon to produce false spirituality and false signs and wonders. A good portion... In my, in my youth, when I look at my when I'm youth, I'm talking about, you know, 18 on up. I was, when I was in Germany in the military, there was a real move of God in the middle of the charismatic movement. I've seen real signs and wonders. I've also seen what happens when God shows up. People hit the ground, not because they're slain in the spirit with Holy Ghost goosebumps, but because they feel the holy presence of God to the place where you don't even want to breathe because the holiness is, is so there. And you can feel, if there's anything in you not right with God, you can feel just the need to repent and get right with God. And I mean, even the, uh, I've been in meetings where even the little babies would make noise. Now, they didn't have much to feel condemned about. What they would do is they would sell in the presence of God and just take a nap in their mama's arms. I have seen them go immediately from fussing to, oh, this is wonderful, <laughs> and, and just fall asleep and, and just curl up in the middle of the floor and go to sleep at somebody's home when the Spirit of God comes in. At the same time, there's snot and tears and everything else flowing because everybody else feels such conviction and, and just a need to get right with God. Man, that's what, to me, that's revival. If sin is not driven out, it's not revival, it is a facade. Because God will allow false signs and wonders in our midst, just like He allowed false prophets in their midst. He says, this is a test. Do you like Holy Ghost? Do you like goosebumps? Do you like signs and wonders? Or do you love me? And do you love me enough to know the difference? Because in the last days there is going to be an ascendancy of the occult arts. As, as the iniquity force rises in the earth, it's going to bring signs and wonders beyond belief. And the remnant have to be able to say, that's not of God. I will not be a part of that. I will withdraw myself regardless of the cost. I will not be a part of that. that, that now that takes character. That takes a man like David that was after God's own heart, not, after, not worried about the people, not worried about all these things, but just solely 
worried about what God thinks, what God has commissioned. Because all of us, if we are called to ministry, in a sense we are an apostle in the fact that we are sent for a specific purpose from the presence of God. Not from the presence of men, not from the presence of a council, not from a presence of a, of a college or seminary, but because I have had this experience with God, He has done something, He is calling me and commissioning me, and I must come out of His presence to do, and then to return to His presence for recharging. That's true ministry. But it also works this humility and this character within us that is unlike the world. Now, I'm not going to read the whole section of Scripture this morning, but it's out of 1 Samuel 24. And we see a situation that King Saul is after David. He brings 3,000 men to go after David because he knows he has his mighty men. And we, we see this situation that Saul ends up going into the cave and some have debate, debated exactly what it means to cover his feet, whether it means to take a nap or whatever, to go sleep. And he does this in the cave where David and his men are hiding in the back of the cave. So one of David's men says to, to David, Look, the Lord has delivered your enemy into your hands. Go kill him. And so David does the belly crawl with a knife. And what it, and what it says in the King James is he cuts off the edges of a skirt. Well, anybody ever seen a skirt? They're usually round. They go around your waist. And so we, we kind of lose in the King James what he's talking about here. That as King Saul was taking a nap, David goes up and he cuts the zitzi off the corners of his garment. The zitzi with the blue thread that represents that he is in covenant with God. And what David is saying is you're no longer walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The spirit that you're now moving in is not the spirit of God, but is another spirit. That you have departed from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're no longer the anointed one. I am. So all that's done. And so David retreats back to the back of the cave. And everybody says, boy, he was justified to do that. He is called to be king, and the old king is hunting him down, trying to kill him. What happens to David? He begins regretting his action. He didn't touch a hair on his head. He just cut the zitzi off of the corner. And the next thing you know, he's out there with the zitzi in his hand, prostrating himself before the king, saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it, because as long as you're in that office, you are still the Lord's anointed, and I should not have done it. That is the opposite of what the world should have done. The world would have had him come out of that cave and say, behold, I was anointed by Samuel. Now, what, you know what's amazing to me, too, is the guy that anointed him died. So I didn't even have the prophet that anointed him to say, yeah, he's no longer king. He's supposed to be king. That guy's gone. He could have come out of that cave and said, here are the zitzi of Saul, and that he has desecrated the covenant that he had with God. That Almighty God has told him that he will no longer, that his kingdom will no longer stand, that he's not even to be king. I'm supposed to be your king. Saul, Samuel anointed me. He didn't do any of that because he was so sensitive to understanding kingdom and covenant that he knew that moment that he had gotten in the flesh, even though in the flesh he might have been justified for what he did. In fact, as far as the world is concerned, he should have slit his throat. But instead he tried to do something spiritual in the flesh. And he was so sensitive to the anointing of the Holy Spirit on him. The Bible says from the day that he was anointed, the Spirit of God was, was on him because he was supposed to be king. And he got back in the back of that cave 
holding those eats, he's saying, boy, I got him now. And the Spirit of God convicted him. And he said, oh boy, the enemy almost got me. How do I got to make this right? He said, listen, king, I could have killed you. And I'd have been justified. But I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointing. Here's your tzitzit back. And Saul didn't kill him that day. You see, the, to, to be remnant, to be to the place that we're going to... We, the, the higher the level of anointing, the higher the level of power, the greater sensitivity we must have to the king and the, the greater sensitivity to what grieves him. When, whenever the power goes up, the standards go up. Come on. It all goes up. I, I have found, you see, I found the kingdom of God is the opposite of everything that's going on in the body of Christ today. What we have done is we have made this road to heaven a 400 lane highway and turned it into a toll road. Y'all come. Just make sure you pay the toll. Y'all come and, just, and I'll tell you whatever you need to hear as long as you're paying the toll. I'm not going to tell you about sin. I'm not going to tell you about hell. I'm going to tell you about how the Lord is going to empower your flesh and that the wide is the road to salvation. There are many roads that lead to salvation. That's one of the greatest lie. Jesus said, narrow is the road. You see that little dirt path? It's almost so thin that a dog can't walk on it without getting off of the path. And if you've ever had animals, I've got dog paths. And I don't know how something with four paws can create a path that's this wide. And they will follow it. I remember one time looking at that and being amazed, and God says, that's about the width of the road for the kingdom. Because I have found the more I have grown in God, the more I have let this word correct me instead of me thinking I have the audacity to correct this word, the thinner the road gets. When Jesus said, narrow is the road, uh-huh. It's, it's, sometimes you almost feel like you're walking a tightrope. But it's a self-imposed one because I don't want to get off and, ca and to cause me to miss the anointing, to miss an opportunity, to miss the Spirit of God. What I have with God is so precious. I have tasted of the Lord and I've seen that He is good. And I, have, I know what it is to be separated from the Spirit of this world that everybody's drunk on. If the whore of Babylon's drunk on it, so is all her followers. The kings of the earth will be drunk with that power. We're seeing that today, guys. We have, we have the kings of the earth in the United Nations that had looking, at, I mean, you know, there's crazy stuff going on with Islam, and women really don't have rights. In true Islamic theology, women are not human beings. They have no soul. That means they don't go, they don't go to heaven when they, when they die. They are just here for the purpose of the men. They, they, so there's no will un, under strict Sharia, under strict Islamic law, women really have no rights. And then you look at all the atrocities that are going on with ISIS. And yet the United Nations said Israel was the number one violator of women's rights in the earth. I don't agree with everything that's going on with Israel, but I sure don't agree with everything that's going on in America. But I look at that and say, somehow or another, you guys are drunk on something. You're high on something. And right now, a good part of the church is high on the goblet of the whore of Babylon. We've just polished it up and put first church across it or charismatic movement across it, or whatever movement across it, and we're still drinking from the same cup that the occultists drank from and don't even know it. You see, I put all that aside. Gone to the backside of the desert. I'm not interested in the wine of Babylon. I'm interested in the clean water of the kingdom because out of my bellies are supposed to flow rivers of living water. 
And there's a new wine that's supposed to be germinating on the inside of me because I have a new wine skid called the new birth. I died to that old kingdom when I made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. I am now alive to a new kingdom and I will not go and drink from the latrines of Babylon. I will drink from the clean waters of God's kingdom and I will be different than they are. And I'm going to be like David. I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul. I'm going to be like those that are faithful to the kingdom. You see, the Bible says that we are encompassed by such a great a cloud of witness of those that were faithful when Mystery Babylon was in ascendancy that refused to bow. Oh, we, we don't get this yet. You're never going to be a Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and, and be brought through the fiery furnace unless you refuse to bow. We have too many bowing in the kingdom and expecting God to deliver them. I only bow before one throne. And it doesn't point toward Washington. It doesn't point toward any city. It points to the third heaven where Almighty God, El Elyon, my only judge, El Shaddai, El Gibor, Yeshua HaMashiach, to his throne. And I align myself with that throne and I refuse. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to refuse to be aligned to anything that does not flow from that kingdom. The only water that I'll drink from is the water that flows from that throne. I don't care how much prestige it can give me. I don't care how much wealth it could possibly give me. I don't want it. I do not want it because it will cost me my soul. The one thing that I want to hear when I stand before the Lord. Now, he may, he may preface it with this. You know, Mike, for a while in your life, it was kind of touch and go. Because if he don't bring it up, I will. <laughs> But what I want to hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant. You, you learned from your wilderness experience. You yielded to the time of preparation. And you stayed faithful in me when the sirens of Babylon called you. You stayed faithful to me. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than riches untold. Sometimes you can have so many riches that they weigh you down and take you straight to hell itself. I would rather have my pockets light so that when he says, yo, I'm ready to go. I'm not going to look back like Lot's wife and look, look back at Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, I can't believe God's calling us out of there. Oh. Jesus shut down the Pharisees one time. He just said, remember Lot's wife. That was the end of the conversation. Today, the modern church is clueless to it. And there's so much more than just homosexuality that went on in Sodom and Gomorrah. One of these days, I'll teach on all of it. It was a corruption of justice. There was occultism and all these other things that were established in there. That's one of the reasons why we have both Jesus saying, as in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, both were filled with occultism. Well, maybe another book. I don't know. We'll see. But guys, yield to God. We're, if you're the remnant and you've come out of a lot of stuff, you're in the perfect place for refinement and empowerment. Yield to the time of preparation because God will not allow, will not ever allow someone that has yielded to the preparation and yielded to his hands, he will not allow them to go wasted in the kingdom. They have a purpose. And I believe right now there's a lot of them that are on the verge of God pulling back the curtains of the wilderness and saying, Go get them, boys. It's time you've learned. I can whisper. In the still of the night and over the den of Babylon, you can hear my voice. That's what he's wanting for all of us. And that's what God has, that, that is the purpose of the remnant, is we will be faithful. 
That's what it really means. Those that are faithful no matter what. Those that will be found walking with God when Jezebel and Ahab are in ascendancy. When the Antichrist is in ascendancy. Whoever's in the ascendancy walk, working with Mystery Babylon. Those faithful will step away from it and say, I only serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Father, I ask right now. Father, to everyone that watches this video. Father, that the fire of God would begin being released on the inside of them. Father, I ask that a, a, a refiner's fire would take hold of our hearts, Father. Burn out Babylon. Burn out mystery Babylon. Burn out the false doctrines of men. Burn out the ways that have been established by Babylon over all the nations of the earth. Burn it out of us, Father. And then burn in us the image of Christ the image of Messiah, the image of walking in your ways, and a heart that will long for you over anything that this world can give. For Father, all, every one of us, in the next few years, Father, we're going to be entering into that time like Esther that we have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And Father, what I pray for each one of us is that we are faithful and that we move only by the command, the anointing, and the instruction of heaven itself. And Father, we thank you. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name.